Tall Tales of the Wee Folk is one of the best D&D supplements ever written. That's not in doubt. Every review loudly claims it, even if for unknown reasons you want to double check my review of it. But why would you? There's always been a problem with the fluff of Tall Tales and the mechanical aspects. The Fey were friendly rivals to the Immortals, but they weren't exchanging Christmas cards either. Enter the Archfey, which served as Fey on the same power level as the Immortals, as well as the gods of other lesser settings. While the power levels were now on par with each other, the two groups still remained separated from each other for a whole host of reasons, while at the same time not considering each other a threat. They are in effect the Adam and Jamie of D&D. Now it's time to break down why the Fey Court and the Immortals operate equally but separate of each other. I'm Mr. Welch, and it's time to finally explain why she can't be clerics. The Fey and Mistara are the oldest creatures in the setting. That's not an exaggeration or hyperbole. It literally says that when Mistara was created, the Fey were already floating around as figments of thought and imagination. When the multiverse was created and the Fey started taking shapes to interact with mortals, they assumed forms close to the new mortal races. The Fey had no gods. They were more powerful than normal mortals, but then again only just. But the Fey discovered that mortal belief shaped them and empowered them. The more a mortal believed a Fey could do, it started to become reality. This led to the creation of powerful Fey creatures who worked to increase the spread of their own legend, which in turn directly increased the power of the Fey. Still, they were nowhere near the power of the gods. Then, when the gods and the primordials warred against each other and the Fey were hammered into the form of elves to serve as cannon fodder for the corrupt Seldarin, everything changed with a single act of defiance. To avoid retelling a story already covered in the video about Oberon, in short, when the power-mad elven god Corellian Lorathian demanded more Fey to be sacrificed to satisfy his ego in the genocidal quagmire that was the Dawn War, Oberon said no. What the spoiled Ponzi get didn't realize was that Oberon had already cut a deal with the Old Ones to remove him and as many Fey as he could save from the meat grinder of the Dawn War and preserve them behind the Great Barrier. Lorathian ordered fealty. Oberon laughed. Lorathian threatened a fate worse than death, and Oberon openly mocked him. Lorathian petulantly demanded the obedience that he claimed was his right, and Oberon responded with a single rude gesture. The greater god had been humiliated by a lowly she. Lorathian couldn't cross the Great Barrier to punish the impertinent Oberon. His magics failed when he directed them at the she, and any creatures he sent across to retaliate would be crushed by the army of Fey loyal to their new Ardri. A large host of mortals had gathered to see the wailing of one of the most powerful creatures in the multiverse rendered impotent. Oberon was the first creature in history to stand face to face with a greater deity, and not just defy him, but humiliate him. It was then that Oberon ascended to become the first Archfey, equal in terms to the gods and the immortals. Others of his kind soon joined him, and other Fey outside the Great Barrier began to ascend to the status of Archfey as well. Unlike gods, which are usually created or elevated to divine status, or the immortals who require a sponsor to reach their position, Archfey require a single act that will echo throughout history, cementing their legend. From Ariel circumnavigating the globe in an entire day, Kredilev having an entire Thaisian legion fight to the death to earn the sole survivor her love for a single night, or Bregbevel drinking an entire dwarven fortress under the table, even if the last 20 shots were done purely by muscle memory. The legendary action required to become an Archfey is unique and can never be repeated. Much like immortals use power to fuel their abilities, Archfey have the trait of wonder. This is earned like power, with the Archfey gaining wonder instead of experience. Archfey have no need of worshippers, they existed before mortals and don't need them to continue to exist. What they do need from mortals is attention. To gain wonder, Archfey need an audience, the bigger the better. The audience needs to seem them performing impossible acts, as doing so spreads their legend, and as their legend grows, so does their abilities. It's a game of economics for them, trying to spend enough wonder to impress the mortals to gain back even more wonder from the witnesses. The main differences between the Archfey and the Immortals, as far as their capabilities go, is the ability to create versus the ability to alter. An Immortal can blink a planet into existence with a snap of his fingers. It's their defining trait. They do it better than even the greater gods on the other side of the barrier. Archfey can't create new things, but they can alter existing things with far greater ease than Immortals. An Immortal can create a plane through power points, though the cost isn't cheap. Altering the plane, however, requires the Immortal to change each aspect one step at a time. For Archfey, alteration is done all at once. This is how many of the Sylvan races came about with a blink of an eye. While Immortals can only change things they have created, Archfey don't have that restriction. 
If Mab wants to turn everything in Ed's Antiodal's personal realm purple, she can. She better be ready to defend herself, but it's perfectly within her power. You can see why the Immortals and Archfey tend to have a beef with each other. The groups do share quite a few abilities, including the immunity to mortal magic, among others. They also have nigh invulnerability to mortal attacks, the ability to create artifacts, though, though Archfey artifacts are notoriously fickle, and other minor abilities such as regeneration. Archfey can use Wonder to cast spells, except for spells that create, of course. A few minor differences include Archfey have True Sight over Infravision, naturally, the inability to grant Wonder-like power, and the Archfey have no restrictions on entering the Prime Material Plane. That last one is another sticking point between the two groups. Archfey improve upon several Fey abilities when they reach the height of the Fey Courts. Most importantly, their personality is locked in, even if their corporeal form is destroyed. Normally, when a Fey has its body destroyed, it reforms in the Good Kingdom, but its personality can be scrambled, much like a Time Lord regenerating. If you can somehow destroy Gwyn Apnuth's mortal form, first check your math, but when he reforms, he will still have the same personality, the same form, and more importantly, the same stats. His legend might take a hit, which lowers his overall wonder capacity, but he will still be the same Gwyn Apnuth. Another aspect of being an Archfey is you gain a legendary form. Ariel was a normal pixie in his regular fey life, but when he achieved archfey status, he permanently changed his appearance to a larger humanoid shape, as well as his unique bluish hue and the visible blur he creates just by standing still. There's no mistaking Ariel for anyone else because of this, which is exactly what a creature that thrives on attention needs. Archfey can change their shape easily enough, especially in the prime material plane, mainly due to the fact that a lot of their legendary forms just don't fit in mortal dwellings. Gilly Dew looks like a tall, emaciated treant in his own domain, but outside of it he takes on the form of a brown-skinned dwarf to avoid standing out too much to the villages he protects. A unique aspect of the Archfey is their ability to alter magic far beyond what even the Immortals can do. Their alteration powers allow partial transformation, even changing an aspect of a creature that would normally be fatal but somehow isn't. A classic example of this is Oberon setting a rude petitioner's bones on fire, putting the creature into endless agony but otherwise not harming it. Changing a creature into a plant or an inanimate object but maintaining its awareness is a common trick done by the Archfey. For them, killing a creature isn't enough, it's about sending a message. A creature so changed can be restored by powerful mortal magic, though if the Archfey is sufficiently angry they can stop the restoration by any being that's less powerful than they are. Immortals can undo the change, though again, the two groups tend to avoid each other. Archfey do have several restrictions, both natural and self-opposed. Their biggest prohibition is the use of their powers to harm mortals. Archfey can generate terror instead of wonder, but it's a poor substitute and is only used by the unseely Archfey. Terror can be used as fuel for any of the Archfey's abilities, including casting spells, but it also removes more wonder than the terror earned. Because of this, unseely are rarely the same power level as seely Archfey. Terror might fuel the Unseelie's power, but it is a poor substitute for Wonder. Oberon keeps the Archfey on a leash, with the level of autonomy allowed based on their personal relationship with him. He famously keeps Titania close to him, often restricting her relations with mortals, but that's more due to their insanely tumultuous relationship. He allows the Unseelie to hunt mortals to a certain extent to remind others of the power of the Fey. As long as the Archfey do not threaten the overall legend of other Archfey, he lets them focus on their various obsessions. If an Archfey crosses a line or courts open conflicts with mortals or immortals, he won't hesitate to lock the offender inside the Good Kingdom, usually as a water spout in his garden for a few centuries if need be. The relationship between the Archfey and the immortals is very complicated. You've got two incredibly powerful groups, each incapable of dying, both wielding potent magics, and requiring vastly different resources. The Archfey don't need worshippers, and many immortals don't care what most mortals think of them. While conflicts have erupted many times in the past, both groups agree that open war between the two is pointless. Both of them need mortals for their own purposes, and mortals can both worship the immortals and tell tales of the Archfey at the same time. When disagreements happen, the two groups will meet to discuss the proper course of action. The immortals will often send more even-minded representatives, such as Ka or Corius, while the Mercurial Archfey will send somebody that reflects their opinion on the matter. The Immortals much prefer dealing with the humorous Gwynop Nuth to the Manic Robin Goodfellow. If the emergency is world-threatening, then Oberon and Titania will personally meet with the hierarchs of the Immortals. This has happened only a handful of times, such as the destruction of Blackmoor, when cooperation required all old grudges to be set aside. 
Ixion might object to someone messing with his plans, as much as Oberon hates it when people mess with his fun, but they both need the mortals. In general, Archfey and Immortals rarely interact. There are a few exceptions when natural friendships form, like in the case of Robin Goodfellow and Raven. The Archdevil Glacia is still trying to cover up the number of prisoners those two freed on their vacation in Malbolge. Others, such as Crethileth and Valerius, are rivals because of their shared interest, though their conflicts are purely political after warnings from their superiors. However, those are the exceptions. If a dozen dragons get ginsued up by Gwyn Upnuth trying to break into his magical kingdom, the Great One isn't going to bring it up because Gwyn is just doing his job. Those dragons should have known better because there are legends of the guy doing just that. The two groups act like distant relatives, only getting together when needed and otherwise leaving each other alone. Some would like a formal alliance between the two, but the immortals can't be bothered with creatures they can't easily manipulate, and the Archfey are naturally chaotic in their philosophy and they don't do long-term deals. Most of the information on the Archfey powers were part of an unfinished project I had worked on with some people back on the Mastara Reborn page. It's a continuity fix. It was an attempt to make the Archfey on par with the Immortals with similar rules. Archfey use Wonder-like XP similar to the Immortals, with Terror working for evil Archfey, though at a steep penalty. One day, hopefully, we will pick it back up. In the meantime, use these more like guidelines for your games. Next week, we are looking at the constructs of Mastara, and Mastara loves its constructs. Unique golems, the famous living statues, all the Magan, and more constructs than I can talk about in a brief summary. If you haven't grabbed the Mastara Player's Handbook, head over to RPGMP3.com where it's free. But until next week, remember, you're not the boss of me, Laratheon.